The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our weekly Wednesday webinar. We are so glad that you have joined us today and are excited to be part of our form space party. And I don't know about you, if you feel like you're in the party mood, I mean, it is after spring break for most districts. Some districts are, are on spring break this week, but, you know, it's getting towards the end of school. Am I correct? So it's kind of a party atmosphere, and we are definitely glad that you have joined us today. Your host today, and Catherine, it's probably her first time seeing this. I did add a party hats because we are talking about a celebration, a party in form space. Uh, I am Joel Adkins. I'm a training specialist with Eduphoria. Catherine is joining me. She's also a training specialist and part of our DET, our district engagement team. And then in the background, answering questions, who is not pictured in this photo, but is also part of the party, is Paige. So Paige is going to be answering questions if you post those for us to answer as we go through this. So this is fun forms and form space. Woohoo! A form space party. And we are going to have a party today in form space. Because what is more fun in life than taking a paper form and making it digital? It is just so exciting, is it not? If you have questions about this topic as we're going and maybe we're not covering something, you need clarity on it, or you just want to say woohoo, there is a questions box in your little uh, GoToWebinar chat uh, control panel. Feel free to post questions there. Again, that's where Paige is. You may not hear Paige much in this unless I let her speak, but uh, you can post questions in there. You can post comments. You can post a woohoo if you want. You can say, welcome to the party. However you want to celebrate being part of the form space demonstration today, post in there, and we can answer those questions for you. Catherine can also answer questions, and then I can also answer questions as we go as well. I wanted to tell you, I have been going into our help section. If you uh, need help, if, if, they're, if we cover something too quickly or you need to reference something, <clears throat> our help resources are available to you. Help is available inside of our application on the screen. Oh, let me go back here. If you go to the main application screen, help is on the top right. If you're inside of an application like Formspace, the help is also on the top right. And then in Strive, it's now on the left side. And it will take you to our help section where I have been updating a lot of our help for forms. So here is the menu inside of help for building forms. You can see we cover a lot of information in there. A lot of the things that we're going to cover today are already in those help documents, so they can help you. There are screenshots in there. Um, Catherine also has created a lot of these training materials that are in there, so we have good information to help you get started on using form space. And one thing that you'll notice is there's if you're actually in the help section under building forms, there's actually a new article that was put in there before this webinar started that teaches about the different types of forms that are available. So that is all in our help section. Maybe at the end, I'll go through some of those to show you what those look like now. But we are updating our help to have more images, more current images, and make sure it's available to help you with implementing using our applications. So with that in mind, I'm going to drop out of this, and I'm actually going to do a poll. We're going to do a poll here. I want to learn about you to see what all you know about form space. So I'm going to launch this poll. You should see it pop up on your screen. And you can answer those questions as they're coming. Oh, I see. Look at this. Oh, getting a few responses. <laughs> we have quite a diverse group here. So everyone answered. I'm going to close the poll. I'm going to count down five, four, three, two. Oh, still getting some answers here. Three, 
two, one. And I'm going to share these results so you can see them as well. So the question was, how many forums have you created in form space? And 33% of you say zero. There's a first time for everything. An another group of 33%, one to five. Look at this, 21%, over 20. I deserve a trophy. Yeah, you definitely do for creating forms. So I'm going to ask another poll question. Maybe this will help us uh, determine more about um, the, how your, the level of skill that you have for designing forms. So let's try this one. The question is, which level of a form space designer are you? And we have choices there. Okay. Yep. We're still getting some responses. You have to read through all of those answers to make sure. Very good. All right, I'm going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. All right, let me share those results with you as well. So we have 29%, very beginner. What is form space? Don't even know what it is. That's good. We have beginner, which is I've made, you know, a form or two. We have intermediate at 26%, have some forms in use with workflows. Our 12% is advanced. And then ex expert level, I should be teaching this webinar, which I think probably Paige and Catherine answered those because they should be but I'm going to tell you I was looking over the people who are registered for this uh, training and one thing that I discovered is someone in the group has taught me how to use form space and I'm just going to give a shout out to Deborah Stevens who taught me years ago how to use form space and she's in the group and she really probably should be doing this webinar because she was really good she had a lot of forms in the district she was in so Deborah I am celebrating you and our party for form space today. So I am going to go into form space, and you're welcome to follow along uh, in your system, or you're just welcome to watch. And uh, as we go through this, I'm going to go through the different types of forms we have and then how to create those basic workflows in a form. I think that's going to be the best use of our time based on the numbers that we got in for being able to use this. So uh, we won't go through every component of the start of using form space, but just getting started, creating a basic form, creating a workflow in that type of form, and then publishing the form for others to access. So just real quick, just let me go through the different types of forms that we have available. For Catherine and Paige, feel free to jump in, interrupt, tell me if I skip something, miss something, or just plainly did not say something correctly because that that can happen in my life so i'm going to actually zoom in a little so you can see the screen a little better on yours but in form space you have the ability to create all different types of forms and the key to being useful in form space is having the right and the role actually of being the form space administrator <clears throat> when you're the form space administrator you have access to this Manage tab that gives you access to create all these different types of forms. And this might look a little different from what yours has because I've already created some form categories to sort by department. But you can create uh, what's called district forms. And I'm going to hop down here to district surveys because these are all contained within district forms. So a district form is any type of form that you create that's available for either the entire district or you can select multiple campuses, multiple schools to be able to fill out that form. Same for a survey, it operates the same way. It's a survey specific form that can be available for every campus, every person in the district, or you can limit to multiple uh, uh, campuses. The district document store is a place where you can upload documents. It's a place where you can take an already existing uh, document and upload it for people to access inside a form space. Just makes it easier for people to find things that they might need. 
instead of having to go search all over network drives or Google folders or whatever to find those. School forms and school surveys will operate very similarly to district forms and district surveys. The difference is they can only be created for a specific campus. And so when you are creating a school form, you have to put in the title and then you select one building that that form will attach to. The same for school surveys, you create a survey, it attaches to only one specific school. Web forms and web surveys, you like, I like how all these are paired together, it makes it so much easier to go through. A web form and a web survey is any type of form that you create that doesn't require someone to log in with Eduphoria. So it creates its own URL that you can either send in an email or create as a link for people to access that don't have to log in. When you create these forms, you also can create the CAPTCHA, which is that code you have to put in to prove you're not a bot or a you know, Russian inf infiltrator or something. So that's the type of form that creates that link that you can actually embed on a website, send an email, or a web survey as well. Personal surveys, this is the ability for someone to create their own survey that they can control and they can manage. So that's a, a feature that can be turned on in management to allow people within the district to create their own surveys. The difference between it and a web survey or a campus or a school survey or a, a district survey is a personal survey is managed and controlled by the person who creates it. Elections. Elections are really fun. They can allow you to run a just general little classroom election or to uh, do a basic, I mean, you wouldn't want to run your board election in this, but you can create an election that will be a simple election, ballot voting for multiple topics, uh, multiple choices, and it also has a kiosk feature to where you can set a, a shared computer as the ballot box for students to select their choices. Beyond the forms themselves, we have Eduphoria Community, and this is where users have uploaded and shared documents that they've created. These are the system folders we have. Uh, the Eduphoria Community is available in our form application. So Formspace has its own Eduphoria Community, Aware, also has a community of forms where you can find student forms that can be tied into the AWARE system. And also Strive uh, has the Eduphoria community of forms as well. But inside Formspace, the Eduphoria community has forms relating to different types of forms used in districts that anyone can access and download. So whenever you get into Eduphoria community, we always recommend you click the green button to refresh documents. It's gonna, it's gonna pull in any of the new ones that have been submitted. It's also gonna pull out any of the old ones that might have been deleted. And it's just simple of going and opening a folder and then you can see the types of forms that are listed. And if it's a form that you like, you wanna use it, you like the look of it, you like the questions, maybe you don't, want to use specific questions in here, but everything else is fine, you can import it into your system and then you can edit it for your needs. And so at the very top of the forms, it's going to show you who shared it and then the submission date for that form. So if it's... Hey, Joel, yes. Joel, can we pause just for a second? There are a couple of people saying that they can't see your screen. So check and see if there is a window that might be hiding behind um, uh, what what Joel is projecting. It might be behind your other browser window. There are a couple of people who said they can't see. Um, maybe that might help. And could I answer one question about forms and aware since you brought it up? Sure. Okay. Uh, we did have a question come up about forms and aware and and forms and aware are different than forms and form space There are some similarities, but reporting is very different If you would like more information about forms and aware and when updates might be coming for those I'm going to plug my webinar I'm doing on April 4th on aware development roadmap and you can learn more about that then um, And let us know those of you who couldn't see Joel's screen if you have found his window 
hiding behind your browser window and and if you can now see him thanks joel for letting me interrupt yeah. well thank you um, it'd be sad if people couldn't see what all i was pointing at of you know <laughs> trying to go all through all this because it is showing on mine it's showing this main screen over here but you know technology could be buggy so this is the Edufori community again there's all sorts of different forms in here and i know we just talked about aware uh, these that are in this folder, this is not an aware form. It's literally a form asking for people to say that they need aware campus-wide data rights. So there's different types of forms that would be available in the Eduphoria community. And it's just a matter of going through them, seeing if there's something you like. If there's a department in your district that's wanting to go paperless, and then they hand you a stack of forms, that doesn't happen, but... Yes, yes, it does. They hand you the stack and say, we want all of these forms in form space. It might be a good start to go into the Eduphoria community to see if a form already exists. Because sometimes uh, in school districts, and I know this, um, you usually get form ideas from what other districts have already been doing. So it's a good idea to go through here. Maybe you'll find a form that asks things differently than what you might have done on a paper form. And then that could be a good place to start is to find a form that you like, that your person in charge of the form likes, so then it's more easily adopted into your system. And so that's Eduphoria community. The last part on here on the screen is the management part of form space. Again, if you're the manager, you have access to management this is where you can view any documents that have been archived, and it also gives you access to the general options, where you can go in and set your different options for what's available for people to access within your system. So those are the different types of forms. Uh, I'm also going to show you how to create a form, and I'm just going to show you in here how I kind of got started building this. Now, I'll, answer, I'll say this. I have been in a district. I've been in several districts, actually. Catherine has been a trainer in form space, um, and she's also worked. Catherine, you've worked in uh, districts as well, have you? I have... Yes. Okay. And then Paige, I know for sure, has been in districts as well. And all of us have had experience of working in districts and creating forms using form space. Whenever I would start this process, I would start without using form space. I would go what I call old school, no technology, which is get a copy of the paper form and then follow the direction that the form goes. So let's say you work at the campus level and there's in the mail room or in the work room, there's a bunch of forms either in the mail room shelves or they're under the shelves or they're hanging in stapled folders on the wall and you want to start the process of converting those into digital documents. The first step I would do is to get a copy of the form, get a post-it, and follow the track of the form. Follow the It's called the workflow. What is the flow of the form? You want to put at the very top, who is the requester? Is it a teacher form, or is it someone in the office, or is it a principal? Who fills out the form? And then track where it goes next. Does the form go to a secretary? Does it go to the library where does the form go and you kind of track all of this because part of creating forms in our system is you can create a form which has all the fields that people fill out but then you can define on the back end the workflow of where that form goes next uh, so as i go through these forms we're going to talk about creating the form content, and then also creating the workflow for how that form can transfer between different people to get them the information that they need. So when I created in my account here, this is a demo account in my general forms, you'll see some forms you probably have seen very similarly, which you might have in your district. And then I've also created my department so that they can find their forms more easily. This is a form I had in my previous district that I've replicated. It's called a new hire resignation form. The way this form was developed was I was over creating all the digital accounts for new staff when they would come into the district. So I'd have to create their Eduphoria account. I'd have to create their 
uh, textbook accounts. I'd have to get them access in Google, you know, all the things that you know that someone has to do in your district. So I took a form that didn't exist and I created the form. And the per first person who fills out this form is someone in the HR department who approves this person for hire. So they are actually the person who fills out all of this information. The basic information is who, who is this person? Where are they assigned? Are they new or are they leaving? And then just more basic information just for our records. Are they replacing someone so we know what room they might go into? And then their basic contact information as well as their birthday because that was their original password for logging in. We just made it a very simple step. Then there's a section of the, of the form where someone else puts in, usually from technology, the district login and then the district email address. And so that form is created in the HR department. Then it goes to the technology department so that they can put their information in. And then it would notify someone with all that information to send a welcome email to that new staff member to let them know, hey, welcome to our district. We're glad you're here. When you first get here and you get to a computer, here's how you're going to log in. And here's your email address, too. You can start using it now if you'd like to. So that's in the tab. When I'm in a form, I have my general tab, which is the title, the category I've put it in. I can design my questions, and I'll go through that in a second. And then the workflow is where I've designed what happens behind the scenes to that document. And in workflow, I can have as many workflows as I need for a document. Most people use one workflow, but if they have multiple steps, they might try another type of workflow for that form. But it opens a tab where I can set the general options for the form, or I can set it to go to all my schools, meaning the form is available for users at every campus, or I can select specific buildings where only that form will only appear to users who are in that profile attached to those specific buildings. So this form is filled out by people at the administrative side, so it's not going to be open to specific campuses. It's literally open just for the, the administration building and the service center and technology building. I have two service centers. I think one was a bus. Then I can design that workflow that will show exactly what's going to happen with the form where it goes to a particular person who approves that user and then it notifies notification means it just sends information that person doesn't have to do anything uh, the approval step which goes to the technology department someone in the technology department will approve that person and put that information in and then it notifies the final person who will send the email out. So I was able to, in this one form, design all the steps that will take place in that form. And it's it goes by uh, step one, step two, step three, step four. So if this approval step, if it goes to Lori here and Lori does not approve it, it will not go beyond that step for her because it is literally a step-by-step -step progression. I know we're going fast through this stuff. So how does a form get created? Well, if you have that manage tab, the first area you can go to is you want to create a new form space document. And when you create those documents, it's going to give you access in each document to this tab area where you can make those changes that you want. So I'm going to create a new form space document. All those document types that I went over are listed here so I can select the type of document that I want to create for just a basic trial and error I'm going to create a district form and I'm going to give it a title here uh, let's just call this one oh let's call it form space celebration ideas and then I can pick the categories and I created these categories in the manage tab as well so I can set it for a specific sorting. It's kind of like putting it in a specific file cabinet that users can access, but I'm just going to keep this in my general forms, and it's going to allow me to create and begin editing that document. 
So now the document is showing up in my list over here, but on the far right side, it's showing it still in draft mode. So that means only I can see it because I have not made it active yet. If I publish, publish means it's kind of taking the changes you make and putting them in force into the document. But if it's still in draft mode, it still cannot be seen by other users. So this publish tab doesn't mean it's publishing it for the whole world to see. It's literally just publishing those changes so that me as the editor, I can see them going into effect into the form. But again, if I want to make it active, I have to select it here in draft mode. Hey, Joel, could I interject something really fast yes, here? Yes, please. Um, when you're testing a form, I have found that the best, the best um, practice is to take that form and assign it to a limited department or a, some, a, maybe a district level department so it's not going out to all campuses. And you can test it in a smaller setting by just having it attached to one campus or one department and when you publish things just to test workflows that's that seems to be a best practice that yeah. i've used yeah that's a good idea because it it could create confusion if you're putting it out there for everybody so here is my general tab again i can change the title of it here i can change the category that i've pre-selected the description is information that would show to the users when they go into form space to fill out the form and it's key to put a brief description there because if you have multiple forms they'll fill up the space on the screen so you don't want to put paragraphs of information about the specific form brief description like one brief sentence is fine there uh, let me just show you what this will look like so i'm just going to say uh, quick information about celebrating there we'll have that and I'm one of those, I save all the time. I've worked in technology a long time, so save often. When I go to the questions tab, it's pulled my title in, but I can also have this edit area here where I can make changes. So for that particular title, I can change my title here. I can also upload a image to go with the title. So I can actually pull in an image if I want to use something to put with the title that would appear up here. Uh, the other types of questions we have avail available, so when I click Add Question, it's going to ask you what type of question would you like to create. Title and picture is what I already have. I could add as many of those as I want in the form, but for this form, one title is going to be just fine. An instruction block is just a gray box of information. There's no blanks to it. It just provides information about the form. Um, so I can actually copy and paste from Word or another text editor and put that information in here if I need to. Um, I'm just going to leave inner form instructions here so you can see what this looks like. Oh, it doesn't have anything. So let's just put something real quick. Uh, fill out this form. It's so directive. So you can see it's just a grayed out text box of information so demanding that exclamation point there and then if I need to make changes to it I click that edit bar and it opens up the instruction block there uh, if I want to add more questions so we did title and picture instruction block now we're going to do list question and list question is any type of question that uses a type of list this type of question has show options available so when i click on it it gives you the type of list questions available so i can have multiple choice multiple selection and drop down list multiple choice being i can pick uh between my options only one option like a multiple choice quiz multiple selection changes the radio buttons to check boxes to where I can check multiple items within the list. And then a drop down list is just like what you see here. It's a drop down list of options for me to select one of those options. So I can enter in a type of question here. I can also put a description that will appear. <coughs> and then I can also add my various options. It's showing me three options here. 
If I want to take out an option, I can click the X. It's going to ask me, do I want to remove? When I say OK, it just vanishes. It just disappears. <clears throat> if I need to add more options, if I can spell three, I can enter it and then click the plus button. And it just adds it to the list there. Where this blue arrow is, I can click and drag my options to move them in the order I need. And then the other options that are available are to make that question required, meaning the person has to submit an answer before they can submit their form. I can also have uh, choosing, again, the question format there. And then the other option would be to add an option below what I select that would be other where it has a text field where they can put in their own answer. And then if I want the answers to appear as a horizontal response or vertical. <coughs> so I'm going to post that so you can see what that looks like. So I have my questions, my options, the other. If other selected, they can put in a response here. Let me go back to options. If I make the question required, it puts a little red asterisk indicating that it is a required question. Another type of question is a text question. And text questions are going to be where they can complete uh, text. They can fill out text. They can do short answer or paragraphs of information depending on how you set that up here. Uh, let's just put in like a title. Boy, this is kind of a personal. Don't get too personal. How's that? I like the exclamation points. So I can go back to my options here. Is the question required? Yes. We want to know about the party that you attended recently. We want to know your details. I can also put in the number of rows, so depending on if I want a short answer, I could say just one row, or if I'm doing a paragraph, I want you to fully describe the celebration you attended. The text width is going to be the size of the text box, so if you look right here, like this text box is 100% of the page, it takes up 100%. If I were to do 50, the text box would end about midway through the page, and my options are... 25%, 50%, 75 and 100. Actually, I'm going to make it 75%. We're going to give it a few more rows. And we're going to say that it's required. So that question now looks like this in the form. Users can also select, it's got the anchor here at the bottom, where they can actually click and drag to make it a bigger form if they need to because someone's really going to talk about a celebration they recently attended and go into the really gory details for someone else. <clears throat> the date and time question, this is an option that will post a calendar. You can set it to include a date range where they select through multiple dates, and you can also select whether it has time included on it for them to select those as well. Again, you can change if it's vertical or horizontal for that information. And uh, we can say, when did this part, this celebration, we didn't call it a party, celebration occur. There we go. And in here, they can select the start date for that party. You know, it might have been a rave, it went overnight. So they can set the start time, and then they can also set the end time for that. <coughs> So the next type of question, and Paige and Catherine, feel free to jump in if there are any questions I'm missing. We, we do have, can you scroll back up before we go to the question matrix? Can you go to the sure. list option, Joel, and um, yeah. the one that you've created? Okay, if you're going to have a list option that shows as a drop-down list, the best practice is to make your very first option blank so that in the drop down list, there is not an answer associated with the default option. And if a person skips that question, then you know, you want to make sure that the data you're collecting is accurate. So your first answer should be left blank only if you're using the drop down list. And if you'll show what that looks like, Joel, so they can kind of get a 
a feel for that. And there was one other thing that Darla brought up. So see how if you had option one as your initial option and they skip that question, then all your answers that nobody touched or would be option one. And something that Darla brought up that was interesting in that same setup for the question. So if you go back to the edit option for this um, list question, notice that the final row is is a blank row. Um, so if you're going to add a fourth row, make sure that so add option four or something there, Joel. You need to click enter or click the plus so that it becomes a live row and the final option on that screen so did you click the plus there you go there we go okay so see how the final row there is now empty and i think that's what darla was saying that you've got to make sure if you add any additional rows that the final row is um a blank one or you make sure you hit enter so the last thing you enter is live okay I think yeah. that answers everything. And that other does not do well for a drop down because it doesn't give you the option to fill in an other. You should be able to uh, other with a text box. But not in a drop down list. Oh, correct. Yeah. 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 In a multiple okay, I mean, selection or multiple <laughs> choice, it works, <laughs> but not yeah. in a drop down. Otherwise, right. they would just select other and that's that's all they could say. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Darla, for chiming in on yeah, that. Thanks, Darla. And you can see as I've been clicking, it's been creating multiple types of questions. So um, like here where it says, what type of question do I want to create? This is where I go in and select those questions. If uh, like I have two of them here, so to get rid of one, I'm just going to select something and then I'm going to say remove. So it gets rid of that for me. I love how it just fades. So now we'll get into question matrix. And a question matrix is a gridable question where you can have um, your columns and your rows of information for people to select through. And let me look at our options here. So we have uh, the, is it, a, is it a required question is one option. And then the only other option is radio buttons or check boxes. <clears throat> I know something about form building based on training that I've done in Strive for building observation documents. If it's a radio button, it exists in the state of on or off, just like as a checkbox, but in radio buttons, you have to have an alternative button to turn off a selection. So if I do uh, radio buttons, and I'm gonna set my columns here of yes, no, and maybe and my question row is going to be something like um would you tell us who attended this celebration i'm telling you i like this form i'm really trying to get to the meat of a party um and have someone do like an investigation into a specific party <laughs> that's the that's the purpose of this form but we're not telling people that in the district so uh let me get this form a title so we're gonna i mean this question a title and it's just gonna be tell us who attended there we go and i made it radio buttons um and actually i'm going to take out this choice here i don't want it to have three choices you sure you want yeah and let's just see what this thing looks like. So here's my row. Would you tell us who attended this celebration? And I have the choice of yes or no. So that's, I can only select one choice. If I had that third column there, I could only still just select one choice. If I go back to my options and turn it into check boxes, and let's say I add maybe if there is incentive, as a choice and then we do finished here instead of radio buttons it's multiple selection so i could say no but maybe if there's incentive i would do it so that's the choices for doing a uh mate the the grid the matrix uh type of question you can set your columns you can change the order of the columns 
and then you can have as many rows as you need for that type of form to be able to have all that information into one place. I think I had an example form here. Uh, let's see here. I think it was this using technology one. Yeah. So this is a matrix grid to the effect of being able to do a type of survey form to pull data specifically where people are ranking information and getting all of that into one place. So this type of question, this is one question built using that, that matrix view. And it has as many rows, as many columns as are needed that can fit on this type of form. Are there questions on that? Sometimes that's a, that's a tough one to do, but that's the matrix type of question. Let me go back here. And you can see I'm on this page. I've, I've put in a few questions here. It's showing me I'm on page one. And I can actually have multiple pages if I want. I can add more pages down here. But really, I can just keep adding questions. And it's going to keep expanding page one as long as the number of questions are for this whole document. So you can create multiple pages and then move questions to other pages if you want to make it work like an, a, a paper form, or you can have just one page and have all of your questions go the length of that page. The file upload question, this is an area where you can actually create the type of, uh, for, it's a piece of the form where someone can attach something and upload it into the form. So I've seen districts use this where they're doing like a budget request where departments submit their budget request this way where they have a form and they fill out all the prerequisite information. And then at the very end, they have where they have to submit a document as part of their form. And this is how they would attach that document. And so this file extensions is where you define the type of file that people need to submit. And I used to always just type like uh, the the regular ones you see out there, like .pdf, and then put a comma .doc if it was a Word document, or XLS if it was uh, Excel. .xlsx I think is the most current one to call it. And this is the type of file that people would upload to attach. And I believe you can also leave it blank for people to attach as well. So this is what it would look like for the user, where they click Upload File Attachment. It's going to browse on their computer to find that file, and then they can attach it there. The next type of question, uh, they have signature line question. It just puts a, a please print and sign, uh, and then it puts a line with it. There's no options with that. There's nothing you can do to expand on it. It's just a, basically an instruction block with a line already built into it and spaced out for you. The other type of question, let's see here, we have the a budget list. And budget list is where you can have a simple addition calculation for items that people enter into a form. The choices are you can use the money, you can use whole number or decimal formats. And then you are going to title the items as they appear on the form. I just want to show you what it looks like before we get into it. But this is what the form will look like. Uh, the headers right here, enter item description, enter value. You have control to change those items. But again, it is a simple addition form where people can put in a description and then put in based on how you calculate it, if it's money, decimal, or numerical value, whatever numbers they put in here, it provides a total uh, for that number that's in that form. When I go back to edit, oh, I hear someone. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to 
jump in and say, even though it's called a budget question, it doesn't have to be budget. It could be like textbook counts. If I'm doing a form and I'm requesting textbooks, I could put the title of the book and the number that I need, and it'll do the math for the total number of books. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be dollars. That's why you have the whole numbers. It's just that's the name of the question type. Yeah, I'm going to put that in there for you. So I <clears throat> changed the headers <clears throat> to a description and then the final count. And then it's on to the person who's filling out the form to go in and fill out the actual information as it would appear. And they can add more line items. So if I'm adding uh, an item here and then I can add more to the count when I enter in that information, oh, because I'm still in edit mode, I'm not, it's not a published form. When they click that plus button, it'll put the number as a line item here and add it to the total. And the last part is document ID label. And I'm gonna ask Paige or, or uh, Catherine about this one because the way I've always been trained on it and been using it is it's based on a system where if uh, used to be able to, in the file cabinet system, you could add a label a numeric value to forms. It's like uh, every form has a specific number value and it's also used for tracking. Is that correct for you That is correct. That That's is correct. correct. Yeah. And most districts put that at the very top as the first question on a document so that once um, a new document is created using this template, it auto assigns a number to it. So you can track each individual document separately. Gotcha. You can have leading zeros or not, too, under the height options. Right. So it'll start with the zeros, but it'll add, it's like a tracking counter for every time that form is used. It's just another way to track the information for that form. Correct? Yes, Correct. and it would let me know, for example, that Bubba Smith filled out form 00127, so I could find him in the in the database by that number. Perfect. So all of that is building the questions, building your form. It's very fast view of that information. The key to using this application versus other form builders is the workflow. And workflow, again, is how you set what happens to the form once a requester fills it out. So when I have a workflow, when I'm on that tab, you can see I can have multiple workflows. I have access to what's called workflow sections, which will let you build specific points in a form that might be filled out by some people and not filled out by other people. But when I go into my form, I am going to design the workflow for that form. So I'm actually going to go here where it says default, and you want to, as it says here, double click, and it's going to pop open my window. And I have those two tabs one is general information and one is workflow. The title here is the title name for my workflow. Something I did as an organizational person would be to name the workflow the same thing as the form itself. So I'm just going to call it form space celebration here. And I don't need a description, but then I can select which schools are going to access this form. By default, because it's a district form that I created, all schools are selected. But if I wanted to set it just for specific campuses, then I can set limit to the following schools and select those campuses here. And it's just going to be people who have those campuses selected in their profile will be able to access this form. And I'm going to save because I'm liking to save all the time. That message that pops up is telling me I need to set someone who's going to be in the workflow. So when I click on the workflow uh, tab, this is where I access what steps I want. And again, it's like a ladder. You can have as many steps as you need, and you can have different access to users for what they will do. So the first step that's defined already by the purpose of the form is it is filled out by a requester. The requester, I don't have to put that in as a step. It's already built in. 
What happens next is what I'm going to define. So this form is going to have an approval step. That means it's going to go to someone who has to click a button that says, I approve this form to move it to the next step, or I deny this form, which prevents it from going further. The approval step opens here, and there's a setting down here where I select either a specific staff member or a group. And for staff member, it's just as simple as just like typing in the name of someone and clicking on them, and then I can click save to make it a staff member. So that means the first step, it's going to go, anyone who fills out that form, it's going to go to Greg here, and Greg is going to approve that form. But I want to do something different because I have multiple campuses filling it out. I may not want to overwhelm Greg with all of this information, so I want to use a group. And a group will let me select a specific group that's set up in your management side of either a system group, which is defined by what the system has uh, based on the people that have selected those profiles, <clears throat> or a custom group, which might be a group that I created so I can control who's in that group. So I'm actually going to scroll through here and I'm going to look for, oh, superintendents, they want that information. Or I can say uh, principles. Let's start with principles in the approval step. I'm going to select principles here. And if I click save, it's going to show this step will be approved by principles. Now, if you remember, back when I set this form up to go to other campuses, specific campuses, that means every principal is going to be notified about approving this form. So I may not want to do that. So what I'm going to do instead is when I click on those principles, I want to use the option to limit to school. That means whatever requester filled it out for their particular campus, it's going to limit the notification to their principal to do the approval. Instead of it going to every principal, when we limit to school in a group, that's what keeps it from going to everybody. It's a very key component for doing a workflow is making sure that it goes to exactly who you need it to and those that you do not need it to go to. So that's how we're going to set that to go. If I did need it to go to all the principles, I could say require all, and it would go to all principles. And then that means every one of those principles has to approve it before it goes to the next step. So just making sure you realize these options are available and to select those for those specific groupings. I can add other steps. So I can go to notification step. I want to actually make sure I save. Remember to save. Go to my notification step. Notification is who is notified after the approval. So the choices I have here is I could send it to notify someone else who receives the information. They can't do anything actionable with it, but they can receive that information. So I can set it to go to a specific staff member. I can also, if I select group again, pick a specific group of people and also limit to school. So let's say that Aqua Elementary uh, requester filled it out, it went to their principal to approve, then it would go to their counselor, limited to school, see that checkbox? And that's what keeps it within that group. I saw Catherine pop up. Um, the next one is campus. Campus means I can select a specific campus to be notified, like everyone who's tied to that specific group could see all of that if they're tied to that uh, school. And then another notification step is requester. <clears throat> I used to use this in my forms just because if the requester submitted the form and then it went through approval, I usually wanted them to be part of the process to be notified if it was approved and it went to the next step. And then outside email address is where you can enter in someone who doesn't necessarily belong to your organization who might need the notification about that for that form. 
Uh, Joel, I need to jump in here for yeah. a second on the outside email address. So this outside e email address is a, you see that there's a place to put in that email address and it's usually like a vendor or someone that you're sending a form to outside of the district. So this specific email is not customizable and able to be changed according to each person who submitted the form because we had a question about that. And we're right at about five minutes, Joel, just a heads up on time. Well, thank you. I just saw that on my clock and I'm like, yeah. oh my goodness, time has <laughs> flown today. We're having a party. That's why it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, there's a lot to cover in forum space. There's a lot of information to cover in here. But I, I'm, I mean, I'm excited that we, I'm going to close out of this just to, because time is shortened, but I'm excited to show that about the workflow because that is something we get a lot of questions about is how do I limit to my schools or how do I limit to a specific group? And the key is whenever you're using a large group, you want to look at the option that exists over here to limit it to that specific campus if you're setting it to go through a flow. If I was using it for the whole district to fill out the form, every person in the district, and I still wanted it to go through the approval process to go to someone at their campus, the principal for approval, even if every campus was selected or I just said all schools are selected, and you use the group of principals, you want to check that limit to school to limit it to the requester school so it goes to their principal. Otherwise, as I and I'm sure Paige and I'm sure Catherine have experienced, if you don't, that form goes to all the principals when it might not be someone at their campus that filled out that form. So it's just an easier way to transition into paperless if you're honoring how the system flows now so it goes to the right people. Oh, man. We have gone very fast, and we might have to do another one of these just to go through the rest of what form space can be. I want to, again, plug our help section. When you go to help, it's going to take you. Let me zoom in on my screen here. This is what you'll see. So for form space managers, the basic information of setting up form space is in here. Uh, including the terminology. You might have heard me use words like workflow that you're like, I don't understand what that is. It's in there. It'll explain it to you. Setting up the roles and rights, who can access what. And the, the meat of it is in here for building forms. So everything I covered about the form types is in there. Everything for creating and editing forms to even setting up workflows. I know we didn't get to cover it, but form sections is in here. Again, these articles have been updated very recently. It's got a lot more information in it. Uh, when you go into it, look, here's Catherine. She created this, and she updated it two days ago. <laughs> but it goes through in here to access the screenshots. It shows you how to select things, and it shows you step-by-step -step everything that you need to do to go through and learn how to use form space. One thing that I also went in and did for these articles is it's kind of a linear progression. Like if you go to this article and then you go to this one and then you go to this one, it's going to teach you the basics of using form space. I know it used to be you could come in here and kind of jump around and get confused by all the different options of training in here. But literally in all of our training, we're going to be moving it to be more of a linear approach of just start step one, go to the next one, go to the next one and you'll have a really good idea of how to use the system. Hey, Joel, can yeah. you um, just show people who want advanced uh, form space? There's a webinar I did, and, and I think you did one too, about the oh, yes. sections and more advanced, you know, free flow steps. We do have a recorded webinar that you can go watch, and nothing has changed since then, so. Yep, so training and webinars, that's on our main help page. And when you come into our training and webinars, we have our upcoming webinars. So again, if you heard at the very beginning, Catherine was talking about Aware Forms. She's going to be covering Aware Forms. When is that? That's coming up in uh, April fourth. April fourth. The right Aware here. Development Aware Development Roadmap. So this is where you want to register for that training that she's offering here. If I go back here, I'm. I wonder if it's in our miscellaneous because we kind of have them. 
It is. It's probably way down here. Here we go. Making the most out of form space. Right here. Is that the one? No, it, uh, just do it. Just do a search for. Um, How about we do that? Advanced form space. It's in there. Oh, here we go. From 2016. An oldie but a goodie. Here we go. Right here. And there's a PDF and a PowerPoint that comes with it. So if you search in our search bar, advanced, like our search bar here, advanced form space, it'll pull up that webinar as well. Anything else? Group? Page? No, we have had some requests for a follow-up, so we'll talk amongst ourselves and keep track of the upcoming webinars. You may see some more form space stuff showing up there soon. Yep, and like I said, we'll be updating our help as well. If you ever need any further help, you can contact us at training at eduphoria.net, and we can help point you in the right direction, and we can also connect you with training. Um, I know that right now we are also doing a training sale, so if you're interested in information about that, uh, we have some discounts on buying bulk of our on-site training and also our webinar training. And you can contact us again at training at eduphoria.net. Well, thanks everyone, and we hope you have a great day. Thanks for joining us.